All right, so today we are continuing with our discussion of Taylor polynomials. Specifically, we have this interesting little check that somebody wrote made for the amount of 0 0.002 plus e to the ith pi plus the infinite sum from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n. Whoa, with an attitude. Interesting. Um, maybe by the end of the, today's lecture, we can figure out exactly how much this check is written for. All right, so the um, little recap of what we've been doing is we first imagine that we could take any nice function f of x and write it in an unthinkable way as a polynomial. That already required a bunch of audacity. Then we figured out that such a if such a thing was um, possible, we could determine everything just by from the coefficients, and that would be sort of like the DNA for the for the function. It would determine it, what it is, what it does, how it calculates everything about the function. And then we had this amazing discovery that we can actually find a formula to figure out each one of those terms using uh, the nth derivative of f, evaluated at zero, or at some other point if these were shifted at some other point all over in factorial. Using that, we did some incredible sums. Um, we got the some, uh, the function 1 over 1 minus x written as a sum of powers of x. We wrote e to the x as sum of monomials, incredibly long, incredibly long polynomial, and so on and so forth. Uh, we did it for sine, cosine. Um, that's what we've been doing. That's a recap. And what I want to do now is, okay, so that's amazing. It already is impressive. If we stopped there, it was already an amazing idea for the class. But then we ask furthermore, um, what can we do with these polynomials? What else can we do besides impress people with this crazy bridge between regular functions and polynomials? What else is there? One of the things that we can do is we can integrate like we've never been able to integrate before. If you take this e integral and use any of the techniques that we used before, it turns out that they all fail. In a regular calculus class, we use u substitution, trig substitution, by parts. All of those standard ones will fail here until today. Today we learn a new trick using Taylor polynomials that can give us some sort of insight into this integral. And it goes like this. It turns out that cosine, the cosine of x is equal to 1 minus x squared all over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th all over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th all over 6 factorial, on and on and on. And you can ask for which x's this is converge, and it turns out to converge for all possible x's, all real x's. Um, so the interval of convergence is from negative infinity to positive infinity. In other words, this works for every possible real number x. Furthermore, you can substitute, instead of x, you can substitute x squared, so that you can conclude that cosine of x squared is equal to 1 minus x squared square plus x squared to the fourth minus x squared to the sixth and so on and so forth. So cosine of x squared is equal to 1 minus x to the 4th over 2 factorial plus x to the 8 over 4 factorial minus x to the 12 over 6 factorial and on and on and on. While, here's the punchline, while this one may be impossible to integrate, this one is not because it's just a polynomial. So we get an expression for the antiderivative, although it's not the most satisfying expression. It is an expression, maybe not unsatisfying to some because it's a really, really long polynomial, infinite long as a matter of fact, but still it's an answer x to the 5 all over 5 times 2 factorial um, plus x to the 9 all over 9 times 4 factorial minus x to the 13 all over 13 and on and on and on, and we can be we can get as accurate as we want, way as we want, based on the idea that the remainder zero goes to zero, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So, any accuracy that I want for this, I can get by just taking more um, 
terms on this polynomial expansion. That right there, that integral was impossible for us prior to Taylor polynomials. There was just nothing that we could do about it. Today we can actually write the expansion and do it, although it turns out to be a really, really long polynomial. Nevertheless, it is the antiderivative. Okay, so that's one of the things that you can do with po Taylor polynomials. You can integrate things that you were never able to integrate before. Here's another simple example. That one is undoable as, as a regular integral like that. However, you could change it as the expansion. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial and on and on and on. This one is actually doable. You could do it piecewise. So it'll be x minus x to the 5 all over 5 plus x to the 9 all over 9 times 2 factorial plus x to the 13 over 13 times 3 factorial and on and on and on and on. So you can actually integrate something that prior to the day would have been basically impossible. Today we can do it, although you would need long polynomials or really, really long polynomials. Okay, that's really, really nice that we can do that with polynomials, but what else can we do with these uh, things? We can program calculators. We saw earlier that you can estimate the error on based on how many of the terms you expand up to using a Taylor polynomial. So depending on whatever accuracy you want, you can actually program a calculator to do this, and we could do this before. Here's how the program would go. Sine of x would just be x minus x to the 3 over 3 factorial times x or plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial and on and on and on and on. This part right here, you can program on a calculator. It's just addition, subtraction, and multiplication. This is easy to do. This one may be impossible, but, it makes it but th this bridge makes it possible. Again, to any accuracy that you want. You just have to take more of these. And based on the previous sections, we can actually put a number on how bad the error would be, depending on how much of this we expand. So yeah, now you can program your calculator to do sine, you can program to do cosine, tangent, ln, e to the x, all these could be programmed into a calculator or even a spreadsheet just using polynomial stuff, adding and subtracting and multiplying. So that's also really amazing, things that you could do with the Taylor polynomial. Uh, you can also get deep insight into expressions. Some expression like this may look strange to us. Um, you got sine, you got 1 over x, x. A lot of things happening here. One of the things you could do is you could expand the Taylor expression for this and multiply by that, and you could turn this into a Taylor expression. And maybe get some insight that was not there before. Take a look at this. For example, you could turn that into a six method for finding limits. Take a look at this example. This one we've done over the years so many different ways. We could use it. We could solve this using the engineer's method. Engineer method, where we just try to plug in numbers that are really, really close to zero here uh, and see what it goes to and try to guess what the answer is. We've also done it using L'Hopital. We've also done it using squeeze theorem. There's a beautiful argument using squeeze theorem, using the triangles in a, this is theta, using triangles in a circle. You may have remembered that. Um, anyways, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Today we have another method for doing this limit. And today we're gonna do it using Taylor polynomials. Watch how we get insight into this function using Taylor polynomials. Here's how it would go. We know that sine of x is equal to x minus x to the third over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial, on and on and on. Now, what would happen if we divide both sides by x? Well, that would mean that then this becomes sine of x over x, and this becomes 1 minus x squared over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 5 factorial minus x to the 6 over 7 factorial, and on and on and on and on. Now, if we wanted to find the limit, 
as x runs to 0, limit as x runs to 0, of course, on the left-hand side, you get 0 over 0. And that was the trouble uh, from the get-go. But on the right-hand side, if you just plug in 0, all this disappears. And it's so much easier to see on the right-hand side. When x is equal to 0, that goes, that goes, that goes. Everything goes. And all you're left is 1. So by ex doing the expansion, it gives you insight into this creature. This creature looks a lot like this one in the polynomial version. So this is another way of finding limits. Super interesting. Okay. Um, the other thing we can do is we did this at the beginning of the class or beginning of this chapter. We found um, expressions for these timeless constants pi using the expansion for t arc tangent. We did that. We can also find things like e to the x. Um, you know, e to the x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, on and on and on. So what we could do is plug in 1 here. Everywhere we see x, we plug in 1, and you get e to the 1, and that's equal to this expression. So we get a new expression for e, one that we did know before. Incidentally, if you were paying attention, e was defined to be equal to the limit as n goes towards infinity of 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n. Duh. Um, and here we have a new new way of looking at that. Okay. Uh, you can also solve differential equations. Amazingly, Euler did this. Um, this is sort of a, a, a riddle. If you got to find out what y is equal to. And the only hint is that if you take the second derivative, and you subtract from it x times the, the function, you get 0. In other words, the second derivative looks like the original function times x. And you have to try to figure out the riddle, what is y is equal to? That's called solving a differential equation. You may have done a little bit of it in first semester calculus. It turns out that uh, some of these, you can write out the expansion, a n, x to the n, and take the derivatives and plug it into here and do the same thing. And when you subtract them, you actually get a you get a solution y is equal to some other um, some series. So it's a similar to when we did the integral. I forget what we did the integral earlier. The integral that was super impossible. Yeah, you don't actually get a, what we call the closed solution, but you get an expression using an infinite series. You'll be you'll be able to get the same thing with differential equations. And the key to solving these will be um, the Taylor polynomials. OK, that's, those are, that's just a little tiny taste of what Taylor polynomials can do for you. But I think probably the most glorious use of Taylor polynomials in this class, and my favorite one, is probably to prove what we call the most beautiful and important equation ever created by humans. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not the only one. If you try to Google the most beautiful equation ever written, you see it's Euler's identity. Um, and here, other people will say Euler's identity. Other people will say Euler's identity. Oh, wait, pretty much the whole damn world says Euler's identity. That is the most beautiful equation ever written by humans. And it says that, it says... Roughly speaking, it says that e to the i x is equal to cosine of x plus i times sine of x. Now, prior to Euler, no one ever, ever had the audacity to stick a non-real number here, a complex number, i. That is the imaginary number i, where i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And then never, no one ever had the guts to try to put that there as an exponent much less to try to figure out what it actually is equal to. And it's amazing that it turned out to be something so nice and so beautiful. It turns into trig identities, or sorry, a couple of trig functions with a complex number. This is what many, many people would call the most beautiful equation ever written by humans. And it fits so perfectly in this chapter. What are Taylor polynomials good for? It is actually within our reach to prove this using ideas that we already have. And that right there should be reason to celebrate. I think we should do it. Okay. Let's do it. Talk is cheap. Why is that? Um, 
So here it goes. It's actually really simple to do. All it takes is a few simple lines. So e to the, we've already done e to the x many times. It's e to the x is equal to uh, one plus x plus x squared plus x to the third plus x to the fourth plus x to the five. I'll just do one more. No, I'll just do it one more. Six over six factorial. Oh, no, no. That we've done using our amazing Taylor polynomial techniques. Now, what would happen if I plug in, if I was to substitute something a little crazy here, what Euler did? He said, what if I set x to be equal to imaginary number i times some other number theta? What if we substitute, just substitute this fearlessly? What would happen? Well, the above equation would turn into the following one. It would turn into e to the i theta, and that's equal to 1 plus i theta plus i theta square all over 2 factorial plus i theta to the 3rd over 3 factorial plus i theta to the 4th over 4 factorial, and on and on and on. I'll do one more. i theta to the 5 over 5 factorial, i theta to the 6 over 6 factorial, uh, maybe I'll do one more, plus i theta to the 7 over 7 factorial, and uh, maybe I'll do one more, and so on and so forth. Now, so far, nothing extraordinary happens here, but you can actually clean this up a little bit. Remember, i squared is equal to negative 1. That's how i was cooked up. It was cooked up to be the square root of negative 1, so when you square it, you get negative 1. In particular, what does that do here? If i squared becomes negative 1, this will become negative 1 times theta square when you expand this square or when you distribute the square. This one will become i to the third times theta to the third. And of course, i to the third will be equal to negative i. This one will become i to the fourth, which is i squared times i squared, and that becomes one, negative 1 times negative 1, which is equal to 1. So the i to the fourth will become 1. So when you write all that out and you clean it up just a little bit, what Euler did is said, hey, this is 1 plus i theta plus negative theta squared over 2 factorial plus negative i theta to the third over 3 factorial plus theta to the fourth over 4 factorial. That's because you got four i's there, and that's a negative 1 times a negative 1. This becomes just i theta to the 5 over 5 factorial. This becomes minus um, or plus negative 1 times theta to the 6 all over 6 factorial. And on and on and on. Now, you see a bunch of these have an i here. This one has an i. That one does not have an i. This one has an i. This one does not have an i. This one has an i. And so on and so forth. So if you were to group these, two, these together, you'd get something like this. 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus theta to the 4th over 4 factorial, minus theta to the 6th over 6 factorial. This would be the group that doesn't have i's, and then out of the other group, the one that has i's, I could factor out an i, and that would leave a theta. Looking at you, this one, second term. Then I have another i here. That would leave, that would leave this when I factor out the i. Then I have another one here. So this would be theta minus theta to the 3rd over 3 factorial, plus theta to the 5 over 5 factorial minus theta to the 7 over 7 factorial, on and on and on. And then Euler notices that, wait a minute, these are famous ones. We already know what these ones are. This is a cosine theta, and this is a sine theta. Holy cow. That means that this one, e to the i theta, is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Whoa, yippee ki -yay. That right there is what we call Euler's identity. And it's super, super useful for so many things. Um, I mean, trying to explain what it's useful for would be like a whole different lecture. Trust me for now, or trust the Google. It is the most beautiful equation ever written by humans. Um, just so you know a little bit about how to use it, you should have already learned a tiny bit in, in class like trig. Um, but just so that we're all on the same page, if somebody says e to the i theta is equal to 
cosine theta plus i sine theta. What does that mean? It means that, for example, if theta is equal to pi over 2, e to the i times pi over 2, that's equal to cosine pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2. In other words, e to the i pi over 2 is equal to uh, 0 plus i times 1. In other words, it's just equal to i. Whoa. Now, uh, here's, just while we're at it, something that you can do for fun. How do you take the square root of i? Well, it's not so easy, but here you could take the square root of e to the i pi over 2. All you do is e to the i pi over 4, which is equal to um, cosine of pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4. Holy cow. In other words, square root of i is equal to the square root of 2 over 2 plus i square root of 2 over 2. Just calculating that there and that there. In other words, if I square this here, I'll get i. Amazingly. Woo. You didn't think today was going to be that kind of a day today, right? When you got up this morning? That by the end of today, you'd be taking the square root of i. You're welcome. Here's another one. Another little tiny taste of it. What would happen if I do e to the i pi? Well, that would be cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. This would mean that i pi is equal to this piece goes to negative 1. This piece goes to 0. So all together you have negative 1 plus i times 0. All that goes. So this whole thing is just negative 1. And so therefore e to the i pi, if I add a 1 to both sides, gives me 0. And this, my friends, is one of the most celebrated equations ever because it contains all the important constants or some of the most important constants in life. You got 0, you got 1, you got e, you got i, you got pi. If you got anybody who is somebody is here in this equation in the world of constants. So it's a real, real nice treat to um, be able to have enough ideas to prove what many call the most beautiful equation ever written by humans. Humans with our three and a half pound brain. Very nice. Um... There's more. So uh, come back and watch more next time. See you guys.